WVUM, Coral Gables, Florida. I love those dear hearts and gentle people who live in my hometown. Because those dear hearts and gentle people will never ever let you down. And welcome to the Monkey House, everyone, on WVM 90.5 FM, The Voice. My name is Israel. And I'm Andy. And thank you all for joining us today on this somewhat balmy evening, I would say. It's, uh, I mean, it's doing all right. Right. We're having a good time on campus. Yeah, I kind of missed the cold front, but, you know. That... Uh, we, we had, like, a hint of it again yesterday. Just, like, a little a little cold. Did you, did right. you feel that? Right. We don't get four seasons. We kind of get uh, bursts of winter. Every now and then. Yeah. Anyways, I hope you're all doing well today. We are joined today by the one and only UM Billy Professor Lynn. Billy Lynn. How are you today? So wonderful. I'm glad to be here. Oh, we're glad to have you. Mm-hmm. I mean, this is a this is a unique opportunity. You've done some some very powerful pieces, some some extraordinary work, and uh, right. Yeah. And uh, most notably, uh, the one that comes to mind is uh, probably the one that actually made headlines. A couple months ago, which was this uh, Ku Klux Klan hat uh, fashion out of the American flag, right? Right. And how long did it take you to make that? So, um, didn't take really long to make each hood, but uh, I'd say I can make one of them in a day. Mm. But the uh, the concept uh, came almost immediately. So I was watching um, the president. I think President Obama. This is when the idea sort of um, cemented itself, but I was looking at people who speak in front of the American flags, Mm. and have you noticed that they all stand on poles, and they're all sort of conical shaped? Yes. And I Mm. saw that, and I thought that's so strange. It looks like uh, people wearing dunce hats, and then it was a short leap to saying, it looks like Klan hoods. And then all that was really required was to, uh, you know, open the the eye holes right when when did it strike you as something that you you had uh, like a call to action did you feel that did yeah. you feel like it was your your duty almost to, to be the one to present this well I, I was watching the um the riots in charlottesville uh that happened uh around the removal of the confederate statues mm, that's right and the um the woman who was killed, and then I was watching the the infamous Tiki Torch March with these people wearing khaki pants and white polo shirts uh, saying things like um, blood and soil and, you know... Um, you will not replace us, you, is one thing that was a Jews will not replace... I mean, just really awful things. And they were carrying the American flag ne- next to the Nazi flag. Mm. And I couldn't believe it because my grandparents uh, fought in the Second World War, and they are not alive now. But I thought, what would they think if they saw this? Mm. So I, I just had this intense feeling that something has gone terribly wrong, and that people are concealing their racism behind patriotism. Mm. And I, the just the whole thing just occurred to me in just a flash and um and i just felt like i needed to put the work out there right that's a that's an incredible way that 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 uh, that is a very i think good way to look at about look at it because yeah we did fight a war against nazis all those years ago and then to see the flag in our streets again it does hit home i imagine for you especially yeah, really painful. But the the weird thing about it was um, the reactions of some of the people once I showed the flag was that I had harmed something that was sacred. Mm. They were very upset about the flag, but they weren't upset about um, Nazis carrying the American flag. Right. And I thought that was really... Uh, this right. is really I definitely saw a lot of that. Kind of a blindness, right? You can't... Yeah. Yeah, like they were just missing the point and going straight for the idea that you were somehow anti-patriotic or that you hate America or something like that. So, yeah, that and that, the, but the, or that the flag is a, 
literally a sacred object like um, the Something Eucharist. religious. Yeah, like, yeah, like, like we're kinda, flag worship. It's really weird. It yeah. is. Yeah. Um, um, I've seen and we've been seeing a lot of that in the past year, too, with the, with the whole NFL controversy. Yeah. yeah, it's kind of connected, right? So um, I don't know, like, how do you, how does someone uh, stand up or a visual artist make a piece and not use a symbol that's known to everyone, like the flag or the moment of standing to, to say the national anthem or singing it, you know? It's just like, um, I don't know what, we're, what is left if we can't use those symbols. It's a free speech issue. Sure, well, I find it dangerous that people are projecting these, uh, these, these hateful emotions onto the actions of someone like yourself, for mm -hmm. example, in this case just using the American flag to to make a point that needed to be made at that time right uh, you know we we, we see um, uh, others burning the flag in different places um, you know, across the seas for for nefarious kind mm -hmm. of you know like oh hateful oh, this is to, to to bring down and, and that's not that's not the point here the point is if you can't look at that piece and and think and and understand why it's there that is a reflection of an issue at this point in time in our society and right. for them to avoid that thought and then instead just project all this hate mm -hmm. onto you for for even considering mm -hmm. to do, to make the piece the actual mm -hmm. piece i think that's that's one of the most concerning aspects for me well you know, I knew that it would be controversial. Um, I was a little surprised by the vitriol that it was so hateful, uh, and the comments were very were demeaning and went to personally toward me. It wasn't really about what I was thinking, but yeah, it was right. a, it was Typical personal, today. you know, kind right. of trolley attack. Very emotionally charged. Yeah, but um, I was kind of in a one in one sense glad that that people at least reacted because I had this idea that maybe no one would say anything right and that um, it would just be ignored because I find and I, and I hate to be sort of critical but I find that um, many people in Miami and in fact many of the students here at UM are not particularly in politically engaged mm. and I've wondered about that why that would be do you have any ideas why why aren't because I mean we see things happening like on the Berkeley campus or at NYU, at campuses across the country, but I don't I don't see the UM student body protesting really anything. What well, why? I've I've considered this in the past as well. I I can't come up with uh, a solution, but I can tell you the thoughts that I've had. Uh, the, you know I've tried to see is this a, a function of you know, maybe the way that rent prices are down here or something. Is it because people are more focused on their personal ability to survive and, and so so enveloped by the, their personal stresses that they don't have the time? But, I mean, look at NYU. Can you imagine? I mean, living in New York is going to be just Well, the San same. Francisco is, I think, more San Francisco is even than worse than we yeah. are in terms of rent. So, you know, I, I couldn't answer it with that either. I really don't. I don't know, and I hope it's not something particular to Miami, but just this kind of like statistical chance of whether or not a campus at a certain time becomes politically heated, involved, mm -hmm. uh, active. Like the recent comments um, that President Trump made about Haitians. I thought for sure the campus would just be flooded with people, with right. the students saying something, but that didn't happen. I think last time I saw a camp, the campus flooded was uh, when when he was elected, actually. Yeah. But since then, I haven't really seen much of that. Just short little bursts of people right. maybe speaking on the rock. Right. But beyond that, not so much of a mass, right. uh, large-scale movement. Or a anything. unified but stand uh, with an argument to, to yeah. present. Uh, I, but I, I think that could imagine. happen. I think uh, that well, could happen. Well, I think that the that the, I think when I've spoken with students and asked them why, uh, they, they say, you know, I just don't feel like I can do anything. And it's, and it's like, but mm. you can. So I think that if enough, just a, just a, 
a group of people got together and s and and did something then other people would would join right i think a lot of people all just also kind of just feel very disillusioned with yeah what's going on in day-to-day -day life and by the way i'd just like to interject if any of you and if any if any of you would like to offer your thoughts please text us at 786-309-8861 we'd love to hear from you awesome but yes, I do feel that there's just a tremendous sense of disillusionment that probably is definitely one of the biggest factors as to why we haven't seen uh, what, what you're talking about, like this mass protest on campus mm -hmm. or people just being afraid to speak out yeah, or anything uh, about like that. Yeah, about that, about this, this fear to speak out, um, but also the concept of activism. Have you heard of the tunnel of oppression that happened? I was just about to mention that. No, what is it? <laughs> okay, so this was a... Um, an event that we covered in our last show, uh, right. for those of you guys listening here, we um, where, where you are walked through different rooms that are that are sculpted to represent the emotions that someone is going through under each of the types of oppression that they wanted to. Where was this? So this, this was, was in the Shalala Center, 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 actually. Yeah. Awesome. It was yeah. No, this was pretty fantastic, uh, and, and it was the caliber of of uh, activism that normally you know we hear about uh, at different universities just this one didn't go viral so at the very least we do have these kinds of That's situations good to hear. yeah and uh, what, was, what was cool is that at the end of these different exhibits uh, which are guided tours through it with mm -hmm. a group you sit as a group and discuss mm -hmm. uh, as best as we could in that time limit how we felt about what we did just gone through and uh, you know, we did manage to spur a discussion, you and I, and, and, right. and a few of us there for a bit. Uh, right. That did actually come to mind, though. That's amazing. Like how uh, there, there were there were a bunch of people in the circle who actually didn't speak out or seemed too afraid to really speak out about their personal thoughts or experiences. It looked to me like most of the, uh, like if with our representative group, that the majority of students there just never experienced this stuff firsthand, or at the very least, didn't realize. Uh, that it was happening right. around them. Wow. Well, you know, I personally haven't Because uh, this haven't was a circle that just took place right after we saw the exhibit, so they were probably just ingesting it, trying to process it. Mm -hmm. uh, and it was hard for them true. to come up to something on a whim. Mm -hmm. No, th that's true. You know, I, I'm thinking of, you know, from my perspective, where I've, I've done some articles on, let's say, trafficking already. I can't imagine having confronted the concept of trafficking for the first time that day. Um, it did help me personally, having gone through that, yeah. to absorb the information. Mm -hmm. So it's they could have just shocking. been blindsided. That's a yeah. good point. Right. How did you, by the way, deal with, uh, as you said, all the vitriol, all the criticism of uh, your, you your know, these, art? These, yeah. these children, basically, these <laughs> childish arguments. Um, you know, it was really painful in the beginning because uh, a lot of it happened really early on, like in the first few days because someone at the gallery called Fox News and Fox has a certain audience sure. and that those people came after me oh, and then it went you know national mm. and so I think after about two or three days um, CNN got a hold of it and um, NPR and so uh, then I started hearing from people who were very supportive but I think the um, most sort of the support that I really felt in my heart was I started getting postcards. Mm. And I, I, I didn't know. Did you know postcards are back? I didn't know this. But right. <laughs> people are sending me postcards. Now that Is this to a be thing? Mm. Well, Were these postcards? positively done? Yeah. Because, okay, oh, that's nice. Yeah. So... Um, like they're, they're, they're less they're prevalent, some, that's for sure. But there, I, there's I, some families that are keeping. I don't know. I haven't gotten a postcard. I still send letters to people. Honestly, I do yeah. too. But I mean, I haven't gotten a postcard in 30 years, and so I've, I'm I getting these. I haven't sent one for like. But anyway, I'm getting postcards right. from all over the country and the world, mm. and um, some of the best ones were from uh, African American women, who were um, middle aged or older, and and they immediately, you know, they were wonderful they said stuff like um you know i know exactly what you mean by this piece um don't be intimidated keep going and it meant a lot to me that you stood up and said something because the you know the th three of us are are you know white people sitting here we're free and we've and the two of you are men so you've been really free hmm. yeah, I've been uh, 
you know, it, you're you're not you have never really felt threatened. I would guess. Maybe you have. I don't know. Well, yeah, I'm also Hispanic, but I haven't even I haven't been in that right. That I'm a realm Hispanic where, immigrant, where and I have dealt with people. Really, um, yeah. Yeah. I wasn't forced to deal with uh, an entire environment uh, geared against my race or my culture yeah. or whatever. Right. Probably because down here, like it's the majority, right? You know, that's that's a tough way to think about it. I can't really. Um, you know, down here, the majority concept is that it's okay to like. We don't have issues with the fact that people are Hispanic. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Most well, of us are Hispanic. I, I'm from the middle of nowhere, Louisiana, and people <laughs> have problems with Hispanics there. Oh yes, it's a very I mean, racist place a friend of mine has been through a situation like uh, yeah so it's Spanish. really awful but anyway hearing from these people who were really supportive and understood what i was trying to do was amazing and um and then i just i just thought wow this it's so wonderful that people are um that people would like to i don't know that art has this kind of power right you know, it's not just a pretty thing hanging on the wall. It's actually causing people to think and get really angry or really sad or really something. At least it's causing some sort of feeling. It's not just a decorative thing sitting somewhere. So right. it was just, it made me feel like, oh, well, maybe art uh, can play a very important role in this process that we're, we're you do realize, I mean, y'all are really young, but... Uh, yeah, I remember yeah, yeah. I remember the midst of the Vietnam War and the end of it. And we're living at a time like that one. This is, right. when people look back on this, uh, they're going to see that this was as big a sea change as any because we have all the stuff happening in the, I mean, I think the figures are there's 64 million people who are refugees in the world right now. Mm-hmm. And the United States is not really feeling it. Uh, because for right. one thing, a lot of them are cynical about the idea, I feel. Yeah, very cynical. Uh, climate change. Miami is going to be like the first city impacted. So we need to, to get on climate change. And we get we need to get on the, the whole sort of opening of the Caribbean and South America. Miami is going to be the gateway uh, of South America into the rest of the country, and so we're we're positioned. This place is positioned to yeah. be like um, no, really no, important. It, it, and this has been known. That this is what's amazing. Like you're saying, um, that y- you see a resurgence of of kind of like maybe a bit of ignorance of the past, things that we'd gotten over, that all of a sudden now we've tumultuously found ourselves in again. It was never a question, right, that climate change was something that we needed to be careful with and control in a way, because we knew that we were affecting it. We've known this since the Industrial Revolution. That's right. It was a scientific fact. That's right. Now it's like, you know, uh, you know vaccines are being questioned, right. um, and flu deaths are on the rise. And and now there's politics mixed in with it all, which only makes it even more divisive and makes people think, oh, this is just a, 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 a democratic cover-up or something, you yeah. know. Mm-hmm. It's sad. But the good news is this, that it's, it's kind of getting to the point where people can't deny that we have serious, serious problems. That, and it's, it's going to be your generation and the people who are coming up behind you who are really going to have to deal with the effects of climate change because I'm going to be out of here. Yeah. But I'm telling you that we knew about this when I was 10 because we were talking about it. So why couldn't we do anything? As kids. As kids, you guys used to to discuss. I was, was there for th- that. no. I was I was there for the first Earth Day. We've <laughs> known this since I was ten years old. Man. But no, we couldn't bring people. People only act when it's like an emergency, apparently. But I'm saying it's like it's an emergency. <laughs> <laughs> we I now have an emergency. Andy before I think social media <laughs> is a lot what dampens this this sort of activism that I, I think uh, compared to now was very much present in say the '60s. Uh, it, it's made people a lot more cynical. It's made people a lot more doubtful because now you just have this huge spread of information of people from different backgrounds, just millions of people saying uh, it, it, it's really just one big case of h- cognitive dissonance, yeah, I yeah, feel. Exactly. Yeah. No, and can you imagine, uh, well, we can't imagine, choosing someone or, or a concept, an ideology to stand behind, it's going to be, it's more difficult with so many things going on, this this huge flood of information. Mm-hmm. So you, you know, you, you won't 
n you'll never feel like you're backing the right one because there might be one that's slightly different that could be better towards your cause. And, and what I'm talking about is anything from movements to, to um, I guess, uh, the, you know, ideologies that are, are being spread by any particular people that you might aspire to or whatever. It makes it tough to follow or to, to have a, a unified group effort, okay, like the civil rights movement, where people know where to look to see what's happening with that front. Yeah, I just, I guess getting older, that's the only advantage is that it seems really clear to me. Oh, yeah? Yeah. Uh, not that the choices are clear or how we should maybe take it on, but if you just think, okay, how do I make it so that my children have a world that's intact, where there are elephants wandering Africa free? How, how, what would make a world that, that could happen? Or how do I make sure that the food supply is not covered with pesticides? So for me, the choices are like, what kind of world do I want my children and grandchildren to have? And then start working for that world. And anything that doesn't take you to a place where like, this is how I hand it off to the next generation better than I found it, then you know which way to choose. So excluding people, um, saying basically to people that if that it, it's in this country it's getting to be that it's a crime to be poor and that if you're poor and you don't have access to medical care well then you yeah, make you some bad choice. choices That's, yeah. Yeah, and, and, and now you're going to be job, punished you like yeah, now you're going to be punished for your choices and, and what kind of I don't want to live in that world yeah. You know, it's like none of us do. Yeah. You know, and but we all know that that, and I hate to sound like the '60s, but I was from there. You <laughs> know, if it's not leading to compassion and love and empathy, then you know you're not on the right trail. Right. Uh, this is this is what I'm I'm trying to get across. These ideas, these fundamental concepts, we run into, like like in your case. There's millions like you who want to leave the world a better place for their future, their progeny, right? Um, that uh, it's, it's not that that is not clear, I think. I think that what is unclear is when you've decided, let's say, that you want to leave the world a better place in terms of the environment, it's hard to find which group is actually doing that right, where, where to particularly put your efforts which, you know, is it Greenpeace or green whatever, which green thing? I think that the, the, this abundance of uh, connectivity through social media and such is making it a very confusing right. uh, platform to actually support the right groups that are doing the right things. Well, I think you're confused. I'm not sure. I'll take it. Because I think that it doesn't really matter which one it doesn't have to be the right one it could just be one of them oh well, yeah you know See, what i mean it's like there's there's no bad choice i mean if you w want to work with someone who's trying to save whales then that's as uh, that's just as important as someone who's trying to keep the redwoods alive there's yeah. no you know no right, right. but uh, um you know it's not a, a personal like my personal choices i mean i'm a guy who decided to uh, to go particularly with physics in a certain place. And like, what a know, perfect like, choice. I mean, that's that's what I enjoy, right? But I see a lot of people having difficulty making these choices um, and getting hung up on, um, no, I mean, basically that. I mean, I, I, I'm with you that the, the way to go is once you've determined what it is that you want to change, that you, you basically just choose any path and, and you will produce a good effort you will do something. And That's right. Help. And any That's road for people to understand. Any road will take you there. Yeah. So uh, what I've learned and what really helps me is that attention brings energy. So whenever I get confused or I don't feel like doing something, I just give it my full attention and the uh, energy arises. And right. it, just try it next time. You don't want to study then just commit to, I'm just going to give this my full attention, this problem. And then suddenly the energy comes, if, if you give it your full attention. Right. 
If I have, yeah, no. If I don't do that, I will not get half the <laughs> things done that I have. To. <laughs> I, I'm totally with you on this. But the real so, thing so. is like this sort of feeling of um, not. I, it's not apathy. It's almost. It's if it were apathy, we could talk about I that. I think it's, it's uncertainty. Actually, it's uncertainty, but it's heartbreaking to hear. Especially on social media, what I see a lot is just this mass lack of conviction conviction people picking and choosing talking points but not really living up to them or knowing what they mean just just more from a cosmetic point of view you say i'm for low taxes but you don't know what that means that's right uh and that's what i meant by confused ah uh, okay uh, confused uh, because uh, there's two and what you were saying is right i think there's so much inf information that that we're drowning in it and that's how you end up confused because you don't know what's important and so what I'm saying is that you don't have to make those sort of fine adjustments. You can just see, okay, what is it that I'm passionate about? And is, if it's the water, then focus on the water. If it's the land, if it's community action, if it's social justice, if it's drug, I mean, whatever it is, then give that your heart and your love and your attention. And then the rest of it, er, other people will be doing other parts of the quilt. It's right. like, just do your patch. Your three-inch patch is your patch, and we're all looking for you to do your three-inch patch. So and we'll have a quilt in the end. Right. That's, that's and, fantastic. And that's yeah. all you're responsible for. You're not uh, responsible for the entire world. That, that's that been my view of the, the fabric, right, of this country. That's that's what we've done. We've, we allow the freedom for us to each choose which little patches we want to go to, and That's you should right. be fine to do either. But if I think you have everyone doing every patch, you've, you've got a massive quilt. Yeah. Do you think like there's like a lack of uh, a unifying of unifying leaders or figureheads? Because obviously, in, when I think sixties, I think you know Martha King, Cesar Chavez. I can't think of anyone like that today. Like uh, that one with so much, I guess, somewhat of a unifying message, for like say the civil rights movement or the really, you can't think well, of it, anyone. You know, sure, it's controversial, but Obama did have a lot of uni unifying right. messages. It, it, his yeah. the way he presented his message. Well, I'm I'm talking like every uh, outside politics. Ah, um, hmm. it was in terms of like what like games. Because people are cynical of the government and Congress. So outside of that, you do need people like us, people who weren't, who don't have such tremendous power, to be able to speak for us, to be able to unify us, and I don't see a lot of that today. And I think partly because of that, it's it's just impossible with the climate we have today. I mean, may, maybe we're stuck in our own patch a little too much. But like, I, I have seen, uh, I, I've seen a lot of uh, influential people from time to time that have really taken control of their niche uh, and, and are giving it their all. But usually, you know, I see a glimpse of these people because they are so enveloped in whatever it is they're doing. It just doesn't become viral most of these things like for right. example I mean I've I've met um, professors uh, well, like postdoc whatever the term is a researcher who's working on on cancer uh, a very particular form of, of working on cancer and you know that's it's not popular it's not like something that comes up and he's not the famous one but in his group in his realm his lab around the people he's working with he is making exactly those kinds of strides do you specifically only refer to a social kind of, like a, 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 a popular leader figure like that? Well, it, it's hard. It, it's hard to really quantify what is, is exactly necessary to get these movements uh, going. M maybe that's just the old way of doing it. Uh, hmm. I'm open to that idea. And I'm, I'm sure you've seen a lot of influential people. Right. Uh, so you know, just like Andy, I too am confused. <laughs> <laughs> hey. you know, maybe we're at a different place where um, maybe we, we want to be like American Idol where we're looking for the Messiah to come say, let's go <laughs> this way or Martin Luther King. Yeah. But maybe things have changed and it looks, you know, more like Occupy where right. people are, you know, clapping silently and there is no leader so I think the question now is and I think the reason that that whole movement fell apart was that the media that could have taken it wanted a leader they wanted a spokesperson but they couldn't find one right. so there we need another model that's somehow right. between a Martin Luther King and a 
And I think not just that. I think also just people in general kind of want someone like that because otherwise, if it's just the people, there, there there's always going to be people who mix, like say the the people who actually just want to do harm or vandalize with those who actually want to bring about change. Right. And I think you do see a lot of that today, where people kind of just dismiss movements like uh, like Black Lives Matter, it just almost entirely, just for the acts of a few. Yeah. And I think that's probably one of the biggest problems. Is just having like a I guess you could say almost crowd-based sort of movement or organization rather than a certain person or group of people. It doesn't even have to be a single person that you could look up to. Sort of like a, a hierarchy or something like that. You want that. Well, I, I think that's why a lot of people are disillusioned with these movements. I don't know what I want, <laughs> honestly. No, but what the two of I, you are I, doing I, with this program is what is needed. Right. So you're having conversations. You're not really in control, but you have a voice. Yes. You know what I mean? So this is actually perfect. Well, mm. see, w th this is why we're proud to have you on the show today. Because we, we also, you know, I feel like we, if anything, the three of us in this room, we share the, the need to act for different reasons, mm -hmm. for different things. I mean, you know, Iz and I, we're here. We, we like to discuss politics, but right. we, we, we do feel this call to action. I think we're very much way. concerned for a lot of these issues. It's just hard to find the, the, the perfect solution to it, and I don't think there will be. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no, we, I can promise you we haven't solved world problems on this show. <laughs> but, <laughs> you know, it's, it's fun to, it's important to, to stay in, in the loop and see what's going on, swing through the vines, get yeah. a taste of the jungle. So. Well, anything that you do, I think it was Hannah Arant. At the, do you know who she was? Who? No. Hannah Arant? No. Uh, uh, no. She's fantastic. But anyway, she said that um, anything, or was it, I don't know, maybe it wasn't this person. But anyway, what was said was, um, you know, anything that you do may seem uh, insignificant, but it's important that you, you do it. Maybe it was Gandhi who said that. Mm -hmm. And so Gandhi, I mean, one person, Martin Luther King, one person, the woman who, you know, sat at the front of the bus instead of the back of the bus. Rosa Parks. Rosa Parks. You know, so one person can make a difference to bring other people along. And it's important that we all do that. We, it's, it's Espe especially if you feel like you should. I think everyone, that's, that's an but everyone thing. feels like they should. Like it has to be a personal conviction, that's for sure. Yeah, everyone feels it. It's just that they, I think they push it down because they don't think that it's important that they act. But right. it's a, a, absolutely essential that you act on on your better angel. That little voice inside your head right. is real. The guy on your left shoulder, not so much on your right. <laughs> <laughs> that's right, and that's a real voice. Yeah. Um, well, anyways. I uh, think we actually have a question from well, a, a viewer or, or listener, rather. Let, let's, let's, I think we should break into some music. First. Yeah, sure. Let's, let's do that, and then we will get to your question, Mr. or Mrs. Orange Man. We will be right back. <laughs>
That was a humorous from a little dog from Super Smash Brothers Brawl. It's a reinterpretation of a song from Earthbound. I hope you're all doing wonderfully today in the monkey house. Welcome back, everyone. My name is Israel. And I'm Andy. And we are joined by UM Professor Billy Lynn to talk about, well, a lot of things. And actually, we actually got a comment from a user that we'd like to bring up. And Miss Lynn, feel free to respond to it. So this person, Mr. or Mrs. Orange Man, we'll just call you Mr. Orange Man. And thank you for texting it. Yes, thank you. Why aren't young people more involved in politics? Come on, do you really have to ask? We live in a society that if you're not born into money, it's damn near impossible to elevate yourself. So the one gentleman's comment on personal survival is spot on. The haves have it all and the have nots get the scraps. The situation has been escalating exponentially throughout the last 50 years. The government is run by the haves. Just look at our president. And the situation doesn't seem to me to be getting any better anytime soon. To me, there is no such thing as the American dream anymore. It's become the American nightmare. And it's a damn shame. So disillusioned? Yeah, probably like more aware that the fact that the very rich employ very smart people to keep them that way and in power. So what's the point? A protest? What's the point when the news is controlled by the people in power decide what we get to see? It's a, it's a bad feeling to feel powerless in a free country. And with that feeling, why is it such a shock that young people are less involved? And that was what that person wrote. Okay. Now, yeah, there's quite a lot to unwrap here. And, uh, and it does touch on what we, what we started with. Um, the, uh, it, it, is, it is harder to, to amass anything, uh, any, any usable wealth to, to propel, let's say, any idea that you have or, or nonetheless survive if you started with nothing. And those uh with the outlook that we've had recently from what i've seen on immigrants it's like no one even wants a startup story to happen anymore and that is what the american dream was and has been for many who have lived their american dream um you know it's i i, I hmm. like how do you address that that sense of powerlessness that he's talking about I see it. I, I do see it in, uh, amongst my peers. Uh, I see that people feel actively like um, like their vote, for example, doesn't matter, or their opinion doesn't matter because it's controlled by some, some raving machinery that they're not a gear in, really, but sort of like the paint on the hull. Mm. Um, and, I mean, th what starts to change that is, like Billy has been mentioning, like we've been trying to do here is that you talk about it anyways, that you you form your points, you defend your arguments with your own with your own peers, and show that there's nothing wrong with going around and and doing what we have the freedom to do, mm. to discuss how you feel about the status of this country. Mm -hmm. uh, but yeah, I mean, it's going to be a lot more difficult um, when, let's say, even even locals of any particular city. Are, are being essentially moved out by artificial inflations uh, of prices. And that doesn't just happen here. That happens in San Francisco, New York, and uh, even Charlotte, uh, North Carolina. Some people that I met there are experiencing this phenomena where, you know, rent prices are shooting above what anyone would normally be able to make. And, of course, that's going to, that, I guess, you know, that is going to make it hard for anyone to have any concerted effort to you know, go in the streets and, and, and give an argument about something, to go defend your country, men. Uh, Professor, uh, how would you address this? You know, that, that, um, that's the problem, right? So I think that the, who, who are you calling him, Mr. Orange Man? Uh, yeah, we'll, we'll just Mr. call you Mrs. Mr. Orange. or Mrs. Orange, yeah. Orange, yeah. orange balloon. Or maybe just orange. Yeah, I really feel that, but I, and I think that um, he's absolutely right, or she's absolutely right, that um, the country has been overtaken by capitalist sort of powers, and 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 we're sort of all in this sort of spell of what can we buy, and if we can buy it, we can feel better about ourselves, and signal to others that. You know we have what they want but um, I'm not willing to give up and I'm yeah. not willing to give up this country and so the fact that this person wrote such a lengthy response means that he or she is not ready to give up yet either 
mm-hmm. or you wouldn't have bothered right. to write. Right. So I, but the most important thing that, and I know this just from experience, is that one person can make a difference. I have seen it over and over in my life. It's one, it's, I mean, there was just a, a kid, uh, if you watch the CNN Heroes program, I don't know if, did y'all see it? It was beautiful, some parts I think of it. I've seen it before, yeah. Anyway, they had this kid who is making teddy bears for kids who are sick, and he's just one guy making teddy bears, and yet he's changed the lives of of thousands of, of sick kids. And so whatever is your thing, the thing that moves your heart, and every all of us have a soft spot, whether it's for animals or for people or for the environment, and if you just do your part at, in this one place then that will fuel your energy and then when your fellow students or uh, here in Miami if someone says listen we need to march for animals or march for climate you know against the effects of climate change or for the people being displaced by gentrification then maybe you can take an hour and just walk and carry a sign this is not about costing money. This is about all of us coming together and showing the powers that be that there are people watching and that we are going to hold them to a standard of ethical conduct in their politics and in their lives and we are watching them and that we will vote and we will vote for people who share our values, progressive values, to support each other Mm. because we are we're people, and we, we have the capacity to love and care for others. And so do not give up, Mr. or Mrs. Orange, or whoever you are. Don't give up. <laughs> I'd once again like to, like to interject, by the way. If you'd like to text in any single thought you may have, please do so at 786-309-8861. Once again, that's 786-309-8861. And uh, actually, I think we got another message. Would you like to... Adjust this one too. Okay, so sure. I sure. think are you a regular? Yes, you are a regular. Yeah, um, this is our red balloon. This Native is red, red Mister Red or Miss Red, and he just said everything she just said thrives best in capitalism. Okay, well, I mean, yeah, that's the, you need a, a right. particular argument. You know, everything we've said a lot of everything's here. You know, so. Well, can can Mr. or Mrs. Red explain what right. they mean by that? Like, what are you trying to insinuate here? No, no, it's okay, uh, but I mean, capitalism as opposed to what what other system? Right. Uh, and, yeah. I mean, we, we'll yeah, wait like, for that we, person to we, respond. Yeah, we, we can't really respond any anything of, uh, of value to something. That right, because I don't think she even mentioned the word. I did. Once. I did say capitalism. Oh, I did? Oh, okay. Yes. And I, I think that if you're talking about a marketplace of ideas where everyone's free to to choose within a certain market I would agree with you mm. that I'm not uh, I'm not into um, I'm not a fascist <laughs> or <laughs> and I'm not a communist either so are we the, waiting for the them to get back to us or do we just move <laughs> yeah, on let's, yeah, let's, let's, let's give some air silence and just wait for a response <laughs> no, I, no. Um, no so what I wanted to mention about this uh, just before moving on is uh, the the importance of the internet being um, uh, continuing to be an open and free place for people to to kind of set up shop their own web pages or whatever mm-hmm. and, and have access oh, wow. yeah. to any aspect of it because if we if we allow the internet to be controlled by whoever's the highest bidder of certain cables that are running through the country mm. that's going to be more towards the uh, our orange bubble con- contributors right. kind of uh, this dystopian direction where it is. It, can you imagine the internet being completely controlled by whatever it is that companies wanted you to see? Portugal. And it's not just because like oh companies are bad or something. Right. Just the fact that it is being controlled by like interest net neutrality. Who pay is money that what you're for. getting at? Kind of. Oh, yeah. Well, I well, mean, I don't have it. to. I don't have to. Right. You know, lose my audience over a word, but <laughs> but that is the the I, point. I, no, I think a lot of people would agree on you that. So go for it. Yeah. No, I, I mean that's that's the point. Uh, that was about it. I wanted to mention. Yeah, you're talking about net neutrality. Exactly, net neutrality. Yeah, that's that's a huge battle as well. And I mean, I hope that um, we get we have new net neutrality because I think that's going to be the end. I mean, we have to have net, net neutrality. Yes, I, I I felt this way. Um, it, I I mean, Ajit Pai, who is the director of the FCC, he he. Uh, 
he is completely convinced that what his decision is and the decision that he made to to repeal this net neutrality is the right decision. Yeah, he so, better be right. He better have this. Better be something fantastic. But that's but in the, the courts that now, it's, though, it's really right? A, that's in the courts. Yeah, I well, think. Okay, so what what happened is he actively passed a change that can be acted upon already. Uh, chances are that the companies who are in charge, the internet service providers, mm -hmm. those companies that give us, you know, AT&T, uh, Verizon, or whoever gives you access to the internet, chances are they're not going to do any drastic changes to how you access the internet, how you pay for that service anytime soon. I haven't seen it, but they technically could. Uh, I did see that we had a senator who was going to, who was writing up and showing on Twitter or whatever, so Facebook, somewhere on social media, a picture of a draft to a uh, a movement to to repeal the repeal, to go back and right. leave yeah. net neutrality alone, leave it the way it is. Uh, Congress tried to force that vote. I think I haven't seen. I have not seen no. what has happened recently. Uh, so let me seen? ask you this: So how how could we, you know, fight for net neutrality? Man. Well, uh, I, I, there was definitely a big movement back when, like, there were all these little rumors saying that oh, it's going to happen very soon. And uh, what I didn't like is that the FCC just dismissed most of them as like scam messages or something like that. You know, mm -hmm. pretty much just uh, undermining the the actual well, passion yeah. that's that went into telling the FCC don't do it. Well, yeah, that that whole that's that's a different effort. That doesn't really address what can we do now. What oh, we, now. What, what's happening right now is, uh, from my perspective, it seems like we we need to have already acted correctly and picking the right people to be making those decisions at this time. Right. Uh, but the have, best we can personally we? do. Now, it feels like now, honestly, that with the current FCC's administration, we lost the battle. Well, okay. I mean, that's that's a little too abysmal because the battle is still very much ongoing. As a matter of fact, if you continue to call your senators and, and, and make it clear that you want net neutrality and despite right. whatever bogus request to repeal it from whatever internet sources have been happening your voice on a phone and someone's voicemail cannot be ignored no yeah i'm not talking uh, about congress voice. i'm talking like the the official like uh the, the actual fcc congress well, could still force a vote act, to uh reverse that decision remember we have these agencies set up such that to to a certain degree they can't just affect one another directly and change the way they each operate sure they're supposed to have a bit of autonomy in their in their respects especially the FBI and situations like this with this current administration that's dealing with FCC yeah no it's it's pretty odd i don't understand where Ajit Pai came with this this driving force to get rid of net neutrality i don't know if it was just political i don't know where it came from and did he work with Verizon previously okay. yeah okay yeah, yes he go. worked with Verizon and and of course the, if Verizon really wanted this that would look that'd be great for him um, but those are the kinds of points that if I wanted to bring it on here, like I would have had to research and really be able to drive something home that people could believe. Sure. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't have that. I don't know. But that is a factor. He did work. He was, uh, yeah. he was one of the higher ups. You yeah. Know, but this is what I mean by a uh, capitalist issue is that if you're going to make it about money, then, uh, you're always going to go for whoever has the box and and those and and the other person who wrote that it's this the wealthy people are in control of all this yeah until they're told no and so we have to do exactly what you said we have to you know call our congress people call the senate and even if they make this dumb decision to to end net neutrality that doesn't mean it can't be reversed exactly mm. I so mean, that, you look look right now i, I mean, mean net neutrality wasn't this is our time. government yes Mm -hmm. Absolutely. This is our internet. So if we retreat and let them do it, then that's our pro our problem. Yeah, right. And and the the positive thing for all of you guys listening in is that no one is letting this just happen. You know, just take a quick look. Type net neutrality if you were if you're curious, and anywhere, and you're gonna have just all this list of people who are actively still even as of hours ago, making contributions against its repeal. Yeah. Mm. Uh, so anyways. Uh, I'm glad we got that out. No, no, definitely. You look like you wanted to go somewhere, Is You had a... You had a uh, not particularly. Is there anywhere you wanted to go, Miss Lynn? Anything else you wanted to do? You know, I'm just happy to be here, and I, th and I think that what you're doing here is really important, and 
I, I just think, you know, you should just keep bringing people in to talk about the issues of the day. And uh, maybe this is going to be the beginning of a, like a more uh, hyper-aware political campus mm. uh, where the students, students take a stand, and it can start right here with the two of you. That would be great. <laughs> you know, we, uh, we, we do have a, another show, Counterpoint, that has been uh, here on WVM. The Counterpoint they, and Radioactive and, uh, both and radioactive. have also really delve into these very serious social issues so you know we we don't want to take all the credit here but i definitely do hope that this campus uh becomes more involved actively involved with how they how they feel about the direction of this country i want to see things happening yeah i'm with you and we're more i mean we are more than happy to have had you here we really well, appreciate you joining us tonight mm -hmm. i loved being here and um if you know, people want to send me email or something, you're welcome to check out my website, billygraceslynn.com, and you can contact me through campus email. And I would love, or, or come by and, and see me in the art department sometime. I'd love to talk with you. And uh, maybe we can think about art that, that we could make to, to be active. Mm hmm Yeah. Yeah. And I with think. that. With think, that, uh, thank you, Miss Lynn. And uh, now I think we'll carry on to another song here thank you all we will be right back thank you
Welcome back to the Monkey House, everyone. That was a town with an ocean view from the movie Kiki's Delivery Service. Really soothing piano, medley. And I think with that, we're just about done, right? Oh, yeah. And, uh, you know, I hope you guys had a, a fantastic time here tonight with Billy Lynn, who joined us. Right. Uh, you know, it was nice to get a perspective on, on what it's like to, to go out there and feel like it is your job to do something. Uh, I think we can all share that. So, yeah, and with that, feel free to tune in next week. We might have the Secretary of Univin. Keep it locked. And also, I, I very rarely mention this. We have a Facebook page. That's facebook.com slash pages slash the monkey house on WVUM. Follow us there. You'll also find links to some of our previous recordings. We'd love to see you follow us. And, well, and yeah, with that. Just, just Keep it locked and all that fun stuff. And, and thank you for night. tuning in tonight.